On our program this week, fish, how to create an aquarium environment, and fisheries management. Millions of years ago, when the emerged lands were still virtually lifeless, a myriad of finned creatures already inhabited the oceans. They had discovered how to breathe, navigate, and even sleep underwater. Without knowing it, these creatures would go down in history. For 450 million years, a teeming and colorful community has thrived under more than two-thirds of the surface of the globe, fish. Large or small, harmless or terrifying, fish have settled in virtually all aquatic habitats, from peaceful ponds to the great depths of the oceans. However, to be able to live in these habitats permanently, fish had to rise to many challenges. The first problem was to breathe underwater, which they solved by developing gills. The gills lie behind and to the side of the mouth. They consist of fleshy filaments filled with blood vessels and surrounded by a membrane. The oxygen dissolved in the water goes through the membrane of the gills filaments and enters the bloodstream, while the carbon dioxide follows the reverse path. To facilitate this process, the fish continuously take in water through their mouths and expel it through the openings located on either side of their heads. Gills are not adapted to breathing gaseous oxygen. That's why fish die from suffocation when taken out of the water. Some primitive species, however, such as the lungfish, have real lungs and, in the event of a drought, are able to breathe the oxygen in the air. Adapting to a marine environment posed another problem for the fish. Water is much more viscous than air, making swimming difficult. To facilitate locomotion, the bodies of fish secrete large amounts of mucus, which lessens the force of friction due to the water. The fastest species adopted a streamlined and spindle-shaped form. Also, many fish develop different shapes for better camouflage. As for the scales that cover the bodies of all fish, they provide a protective shield. To propel and steer themselves in the water, fish use specialized limbs called fins. Depending on their shape and position, fins are used as stabilizers, rudders, or braking or propulsion systems. In most fish, however, the propelling force comes from sideways undulations of the body. This undulating motion is a result of the sequential contraction of powerful muscles arranged in two rows of chevron-shaped segments on each side. To swim vertically, several species use another device, the swim bladder. This organ acts a bit like a diver's inflatable jacket. When a fish wants to surface, the bloodstream, which irrigates the walls of the bladder, releases gases into this organ. This causes the fish to swell up, and the fish, more buoyant, rises. When it wants to dive back down, the gas is absorbed back into the bloodstream. The bladder deflates, and the fish sinks down into the depths. Some fish fill their swim bladder by taking in air at the surface of the water. Sharks, who have no swim bladder, must stay active continuously to control their depth. Fish also face a problem of a chemical nature. Freshwater fish live in water with a lower concentration of salt than they have in their bodies. Water has a tendency to pass through an environment with a low concentration of salts into a more concentrated environment. This is called osmosis. Since a fish's body is not waterproof, the water tends to enter it through the skin. To counteract the water they absorb this way, fresh water fish drink as little as possible and urinate large amounts of it. If they didn't, they would simply drown. Marine fish have exactly the opposite problem. 
Their concentration in salts is lower than that of seawater, and they are inclined to lose their water. To avoid dehydration, a marine fish has to drink large quantities of water and urinate as little as possible. Moreover, it has to discharge the excess salts through its gills. Some fish, such as eels and salmon, spend part of their lives in seawater and the other part in fresh water. They have to adjust accordingly. For fish, living in water requires specially adapted sensory organs. Besides the usual five senses, many fish have a sixth sense, which enables them to detect changes in water current and pressure. It is known as the lateral line system, which consists of a series of small canals that run over the head and along the midside of the fish's body. Tiny sensory organs located in these canals detect changes in pressure. The lateral line enables fish to detect movements around them, an oncoming boat or an angler's boots. The nervous system of fish seems rudimentary compared to mammals. Fish sleep, but it is unlikely they feel pain since their brain has no cortex where painful sensations are generated. Still, by inventing the spine, which supports the body, it was the fish who made possible the emergence of life forms we refer to as superior. First, they gave birth to the amphibians, which in turn produced the reptiles. The reptiles eventually formed two new branches, namely birds and mammals. That fish bone we sometimes come across in our favorite dish is perhaps there to remind us of the crucial role these animals played in our evolution. Around the world, a multitude of species of fish, each more fascinating than the next, filled the oceans. To observe them, you can slip on flippers and explore their watery kingdom. But better still, slip on your slippers, assemble your own aquarium, and observe them at home. During the course of evolution, fish have become essential links between the various aquatic communities. Countless ties link them to the invertebrates, plants, plankton, and all the other organisms who share their habitat. Despite their complexity, these biological systems can be partially recreated at home in the several dozen liters of water of an aquarium. Let's put together a freshwater aquarium, which is easier than a seawater one. If you're a beginner, choose a fairly large aquarium, one that will hold at least 60 liters. The chemical, thermal, and biological balance is harder to maintain in a small aquarium and more apt to become unbalanced if you make a mistake. Also, the larger your aquarium, the more fish it will accommodate. The number of fish also depends, of course, on their size. The rule of thumb is at least four liters of water to provide the vital space and oxygen required for a fish measuring three centimeters. The same amount of water will be sufficient for two fish one and a half centimeters long. The surface of the aquarium, determined by the ratio of its length and width, should also be taken into account when buying an aquarium. Indeed, it's mainly through the surface that the oxygen in the air, vital to the fish's respiration, enters the water. Pump and diffused aeration systems simply serve to increase the air supply by churning up the surface of the water. Once your aquarium is installed, you have to cover the bottom with gravel and decorate it. First, the gravel has to be washed. It is then poured in a layer at least four centimeters thick, or if you prefer, in tiered terraces. This bed of gravel serves to keep in place the stones and pieces of wood the fish need to hide in. It will also serve as a base for aquatic plants. Aquatic plants are valuable allies. Indeed, thanks to the photosynthesis that occurs in their leaves, they provide an additional supply of dissolved oxygen the fish can assimilate directly. 
In return, the plants absorb part of the carbon dioxide released from the animal's breathing. With their leaves, the plants also trap minerals and nitrogen-based compounds, such as nitrate ions and ammonium, resulting from the decomposition of the fish's excrements and the refuse of their food. In order to grow, aquatic plants require a great deal of light. In an aquarium, sunlight is replaced by artificial lighting, which is easier to regulate. The ideal setup is a combination of incandescent and fluorescent tubes, which produce a quality of light comparable to sunlight. However, it's important to regulate the daily exposure to light, preferably with a timer, because too much exposure tends to promote the growth of unwanted seaweeds. Before putting the plants in, fill the aquarium with water. The quality of the water is all important. Chlorine especially must first be eliminated by evaporation because it is toxic. To maintain the quality of the water, your best bet is to use external water filters. Filters siphon the water and circulate it through a porous material, such as sponge or activated charcoal, before returning it to the basin. These mechanical filters can, over time, become biological filters. Indeed, a bacterial flora gradually develops in the voids of the porous material. These microorganisms are beneficial since they digest undesirable matter, converting it into compounds that fish can absorb. The gravel is also host to a rich bacterial flora. It can function as a filter itself by means of a pump that sucks up the water from under the gravel and sends it back into the basin. Despite these precautions, it is important to renew the water regularly in small amounts. Before introducing the fish to their new home, it is recommended the various devices be operated for one week, especially the filter. This helps to establish a certain standard in the aquarium. When it comes to selecting your fish, there are hundreds of species to choose from. Many, like guppies, are fairly easy to raise and even to breed. Some species, however, such as cichlids, are territorial and do not tolerate the presence of certain other species well, least of all adults of their own species. The day you buy the fish, you should acclimatize them to the temperature in the aquarium by letting the carrier bags float for a while in the water. It is preferable to begin with one or two hardy species, then add others four to six weeks later. A heating element with a thermostat helps keep the water temperature steady. The thermostat should be set between 20 and 28 degrees Celsius, the ideal temperature for most tropical fish. As for food, it's better to feed the fish often and in small amounts, so the food is consumed within a few minutes. Too much food might pollute the water. Four to six weeks after you have introduced the fish, the plants can go in. By then, there are enough nutrients in the water and gravel to ensure their growth. Installing and maintaining an aquarium needs care, but has its rewards. It gives you the satisfaction of having recreated in a self-contained space an ecological balance that took nature millennia to perfect. In recent years, the fishing industry has harvested close to 90 million tons of fish from the world's oceans. As a result, the catches are plummeting. All over the world, fishermen and women are joining the ranks of the unemployed. Processing plants are closing down. Entire peoples are threatened with food shortages. Who's to blame? It's a complex problem. Fish has always had a place on the menus of humankind. In many countries, particularly in the third world, fish is the main dietary source of protein. It would be the best of all possible aquatic worlds if it weren't for an increasingly disturbing fact, the specter of shortages. In fishing zones the world over, commercial catches have plummeted.
The economic and social impact of this decline is particularly harsh on people living in coastal areas whose survival often depends on fishing and its related industries. This worldwide depletion of fish stocks can be attributed, among other things, to improvements in fishing techniques. Indeed, such traditional methods as line fishing have gradually been replaced by more effective techniques, such as trawling. A trawl is a tapered bag of netting kept open by floats that is towed behind a ship, either along the seabed or through the water. Fish in the path of the advancing trawl try to escape the net by swimming at the same speed, but eventually tire and pile up in the bag. All the fish too large to escape through the netting are thus captured. Over the last few decades, the generalization of these new fishing methods, together with greater numbers of fishing fleets, increased commercial catches substantially. To prevent overfishing, governments have had no other alternative but to impose quotas on the fisheries. Before they do so, however, the fish stocks, that is the fish shoals exploited, have to be assessed. Ideally, every single fish should be counted. This, of course, is impossible. However, the catches netted by commercial fishermen give biologists a good indication of fish numbers. These catches enable them to assess the size of the stocks and especially their age structures, or the number of fish belonging to each age group. This information is particularly important because for the stocks to renew themselves, they must contain a minimum number of fish of reproductive age. To estimate a stock's age structure, the biologists determine the number and age of the fish caught by the fishing fleets. A fish's age is measured by studying its autoliths. Autoliths are small, calcareous crystals located in the inner ear of a fish and serving to maintain its balance. In a somewhat similar fashion as for tree trunks, autoliths are made up of a series of concentric layers that form each year. To estimate a fish's age, the biologist simply counts the number of layers, as is done for a tree's annual growth rings. As for the fish not yet caught, the biologists count them through samples collected on research vessels. By combining these various measurements, they manage to assess the size of the stalks and their age structures. This technique can be used in conjunction with others. With echo sounder analysis, for example, which is conducted from a research vessel maintained as stable as possible, this technique consists of aiming sound waves toward a shoal of fish. The sound waves are reflected by the fish, and the echoes are recorded by a computer on board the ship. After digital processing, the data gathered can indicate fish numbers and sometimes even the species to which they belong. All this information serves to determine fishing rates and quotas. However, these techniques are imperfect and provide only approximations. Unfortunately, some take advantage of the margin of uncertainty to fish more. In the long run, overfishing profoundly alters the structures of the stocks. The average size of the fish decreases, and the shoals move to greater and greater depths. Finally, since the number of fish of reproductive age also declines, the population as a whole is depleted. Rebuilding the stock can take years, even when fishing is curtailed. Other factors may account for the depletions of fish stocks, among them pollution of the oceans, fishing gear that scrape the sea floor and destroy the fish's food, 
climatic variations that affect their reproduction, and even the proliferation of protected predators, such as seals. Regardless, scientists agree that overfishing is the main cause of the current shortages. When you come right down to it, it's a philosophical problem as well. Fishing is an activity that can be compared to hunting and picking. It takes directly from the sea without ensuring the fish are replaced. Fish farming may be a wiser alternative. More comparable to gardening or agriculture, fish farming promotes the renewal of marine resources. Tomorrow's fishermen will perhaps be peaceful farmers of the sea. Like all of the Earth's habitats, the oceans are highly complex systems. We have to learn to respect their fragility. Now, 